Okay, so in the last class we were looking at a different form of uh, flip flop and essentially looking at something which that one of the problems that arises in the implementation of flip flops is that how do you react when the two phases of the clock overlap, right? In other words, supposing you are trying to generate a C bar, the inverted clock from the original clock and there is a phase shift in what happens, right? which is natural because there will be a delay between, uh, due to the inverter which is introduced in order to do the uh, flipping, right? How do you sort of take that into account when you are uh, designing the flop so that it is less sensitive to that, okay? So we started looking at one particular structure that involved four transistors, right, in order to create a latch. Before getting into the details of that, I want to just slightly digress and touch upon the setup and hold time, right? The what exactly do we mean by setup and hold time for a flip flop, right? And why is that important in our understanding of timing analysis for flops in general, okay? So, we will consider first for edge triggered flip flops. We will also talk about what happens in the case of level triggered later, right? We already saw that there is something called the TCQ, right? Which is essentially when the clock undergoes a transition 0 to 1, there is a certain delay before it then goes to, before the output then reflects that change, okay. So that small amount of delay, whatever it is, I mean it would be somewhere in the region of the propagation delay of a normal combinational gate that could be a little bit more than that, right, it little bit more than sort of the minimum delay through a combinational gate. And typically, in fact, you can sort of estimate what the delay through this, the TCQ is going to be based on what the structure of the flip-flop looks like, okay. So typically, it would be like maybe a few inverter delays or something of that sort, right. That delay is the TCQ. In other words, it says, okay, I am undergoing a clock transition and the data after that, supposing this was my D, the Q needs to go also follow D, right? It is So, D in other words is 1. What happens over here is, there is this amount of delay. Okay, so the delay that we have through this, this is essentially the T, CQ, right, the clock to output delay, okay. Now this is sort of similar to what we have in the case of combinational circuits, essentially what it is saying is you apply the input, after a certain amount of time the output reflects that change, okay. Now what happens, apart from this there are two other timing parameters which are of interest for these kind of sequential elements, for a flip flop which we need to take into account over here, right. So what are those elements? Essentially what we are saying is, apart from this time where the clock changed and therefore it reflected the output, uh, that uh, you know the Q reflected the value of D, for some margin around that, right, some safety window, I should not allow the input to change, okay. Essentially all that it is saying is, if the input changes so close to the clock, it then has to go through the circuitry of the flip flop in order to finally reach the output and if it changes so close to the clock edge, there is a chance that it may not safely go through to the output, okay. What does it mean not safely go through? Either it could go through as the wrong value, I mean there is a good chance that it will in fact go through correctly, so there might not be any problem at all, right. But one possibility is that it might go through as the wrong value, so instead of a 0 you get a 1 at the output. That is still okay, right? Essentially, the reason why that happened was that the D was changing very close to the clock edge. Which value, the original value or the new value, which one should come through, that depends on the exact instant at which it changes, okay? If at all you see the old value instead of the new value, you can still accept it and say, okay, fine, you know, it was just because the point at which I sampled it was that close to the point of transition, right? The bigger problem is if you have a situation where it goes to neither 0 nor to 1 but gets stuck at the metastable condition, okay. And what 
in general what is said is in the safety region right the small guard window around that clock edge if you are, if the data undergoes a transition there is a high probability that the output can become metastable okay there is no guarantee it might still come through correctly in fact in most cases it will continue to work normally right but there is a chance that it can go metastable okay and if it goes metastable the problem is after that point after that instant where it goes metastable that is the output q goes to some somewhere close to vdd by 2 there is no guarantee on how much time it will take before it will settle to either 0 or 1 okay and that is a problem from the point of view of operation of the circuit right it is not that i am concerned about getting the wrong value in i don't really care too much about that because all that that means is either i got the zero which was there earlier or i got the one which was there later it just means that my sampling point was very close to the point of transition both of those values technically are correct they are logically correct values so that by itself is not an issue the problem is only when it gets stuck somewhere in between okay so this guard window that we put over here is to prevent that from happening okay we do not want a situation where the flip flop output goes to metastable condition because then we cannot say for sure how long it will take before it gets out of that metastability okay so in general one we are looking at it is i'm just going to put a guard window around the clock edge right but usually this is sort of split up into two parts we call it explicitly the setup time and the hold time okay so the setup time in other words is a small window before the clock edge when we must guarantee that the input is not allowed to change okay this is now left as a job to the designer do somehow make sure that the input does not change in that setup time interval before the clock edge how can you guarantee something like that by making sure that all the previous delays are such that the data will be sure to be stable before that setup window hits okay so in other words if we have a circuit which looks something like this i have one flip flop i have its output going to some combinational logic gates and finally going through to another flip flop right what i have is there is some clock edge over here there is some clock edge over here after this clock edge the data takes some amount of time to come through here pcq right from here it then takes some d1 delay to reach here some d2 relay plus d2 to reach here plus d3 to reach here and all of that must happen before the next clock edge of this right okay and what you need to make sure of is that the signal arriving here before the t setup of the next flip flop okay so in other words we can effectively write this down as a inequality constraint that needs to be satisfied right tcq which is the amount of time it takes to get out of the first flip flop plus d1 time required to go through the first combinational logic plus d2 plus d3 right this must be less than or equal to t clock minus t setup right normally it should only be less than t clock that is when is the next clock edge happening over there right but we want to then have it right we want it to be such that it is one setup time before that okay so that it just make sure that there is no setup violation at the second flip flop okay so this set of constraints that we are writing over here is to make sure that there is no setup violation at the second flip flop okay what are d1 d2 and d3 they are the combinational delays through the through whatever gates are over there 
right? Now remember that if you have an inverter, of course, you have different values for the rising and falling combinational delay. So in general, I would be concerned with, I want this inequality to always be satisfied. I should in general take the worst case, right? Whichever one is more, okay? Similarly, if I had a NAND gate, then I have multiple possibilities depending on whether the inputs are going 0, 0 to 0, 1, well, no, uh, rather, <coughs> let's say it is going from 0, 1 to 1, 1 or 1, 0 to 1, 1 or 0, 0 to 1, 1. Those are the three possibilities where there would be a transition. Similarly, from 1, 1 to anything else, there would be a transition, right? Depending on which of those conditions happens, the delay through the gate will be different. Right? You already know that. You have already seen the conditions under which it differs. Okay. We need to take the worst case and make sure that even in the worst case, this condition is satisfied. Okay. So this is what happens as far as the setup time is concerned. Right? Now, the whole time is a slightly different story. Right? What the whole time is telling you is, here I am primarily concerned just with a single flop. Right? I have a clock input coming to it, I have a D input, I have a Q output. Okay. I need to make sure that when the clock transitions, the data, if at all it changes, given some small window over here, there should not be any uncertainty. Right? Whatever happens to this thing, you should not allow any change in the data in this region, just around the clock edge. Okay? If it does, it can cause problems in the internal behavior. In other words, you can have a situation where the circuit gets stuck in some metastable state. Okay? So what does all this have to do with the circuit that we were looking at earlier? We will come back to this, right? the setup and hold time and how to write constraints and how to do timing analysis. We will look at it in a lot more detail a bit further down the line. Right now, I want to get back to where we were, what we were discussing last, which was the particular type of flip-flop implementation using the sort of inverter with the extra transistors in the middle. Right. So the circuit that we were looking at was something like this. So, how does this work, right? If you look at the first part alone, the left hand side, right, the first four transistors, then we can roughly get an idea of what the behavior of this circuit is supposed to be like, right? What happens when C is equal to 0? <coughs> huh? It becomes an inverter, right? So, when C is equal to 0, C bar is equal to 1. Both those two transistors, I will just label all of them. So M2 and M3, in other words, become transparent as soon as C is equal to 0, C bar is equal to 1. They don't figure any more in this. Figure any more meaning they are effectively short circuits, right? So then that first, the left hand side behaves like an inverter, okay? So when C is equal to 0, in other words, that first four set of transistors acts like it is transparent. Whatever is at D will come through to X, okay? When C becomes equal to 1, the P MOS turns off, C bar is equal to 0, the N MOS turns off, X is effectively isolated from the input. Okay? 
what happens when you isolate it effectively it means that you have disconnected it from any supply rail it does not have any conducting path leading either to VDD or to ground okay so in such a situation it is floating in other words right so what happens when it's floating you expect that it should retain its voltage whatever it is for some amount of time okay so in other words it behaves like a latch in the sense that you know when c is equal to 1 and c bar is equal to 0 x does not change except that you know if there is leakage and so on then eventually x could change in other words this is a dynamic circuit it is something which has a floating node right which could potentially sort of change its voltage due to leakage characteristics okay so that dynamic node as long as you accept the fact that it is dynamic apart from that this behaves like a latch okay when c is equal to 0 it is transparent when c is equal to 1 it is opaque it, it goes into the freeze mode okay the second part the right hand side the four transistors on the right hand side behave exactly the same way except that the c and c bar have now been interchanged okay so because of that they now work as a negative transparent latch right meaning that when c is equal to 1 and c bar is equal to 0 they will or rather the other way around the, uh, so the second part acts like a positive latch right so when c is equal to 1 and c bar is equal to 0 it is transparent and when c is equal to 0 and c bar is equal to 1 it goes into the freeze mode okay so what we have got is we have taken two dynamic latches and put them one after the other with clocks inverted effectively this is a master slave configuration okay which means that overall from b to q this is going to behave like a edge triggered flip flop okay what edge which edge will the output transition on huh? the positive edge right because unlike the case that we considered last time in class over here when c is equal to 0 the first stage is transparent second stage is frozen when c is equal to 1 the first stage becomes frozen and the second stage becomes transparent so when c goes from 0 to 1 that is when the output can change ok so on the rising edge of c ok now the question that we want to answer is what happens if I have a situation with overlapping clocks we already saw last time that there are ways by which you can construct non overlapping clocks some of you had also come up with some suggestions saying okay you know there are other possibilities we can come up with maybe use PMOS transistors and so on where you do not need to use opposing clocks each of those has certain advantages and disadvantages right what I am presenting over here is one set of possible circuits with their corresponding problems and resolutions ok there might be others as well in general one of the problems with PMOS transistors is that you know you do not generally want to use them as direct pass transistor conducting path because to get the same conducting behavior as an NMOS you need to have a bigger size ok so anything that involves PMOS transistors unless it is just a CMOS kind of structure is generally avoided if possible ok having said that there may be circuit structures where you could get a good behavior using a combination of NMOS and PMOS transistors I am not considering all possible structures over here ok so with all of that in mind let us just consider this particular structure and see how this sort of helps us to get around the problem of clock overlap ok so once again we have a situation where the clock is something like this this is C and this is C bar which is a slightly an in inverted and slightly delayed version of C ok so in other words C bar is probably generated by putting C through an inverter ok what that means is there are two regions of overlap right the 0 0 and the 1 1 overlap ok so this in other words is a 0 0 overlap this is a 1 1 overlap ok we will first consider the 0 0 condition see what happens over there and then look at the 1 1 condition ok and try and understand how this behaves in each of those cases ok why are we going through this analysis because in general given a circuit structure of this sort you should be able to look at it and sort of identify what are potential problems with it ok what happens and first of all how does it behave is it supposed to behave like a flip flop like a combinational circuit 
right? Like a level triggered latch, like an edge triggered register, right? All of those things you should be able to sort of do the analysis and get an idea of what the behavior of the circuit can be expected to be. That's why we are sort of going through this exercise over. Right? So let's first consider the zero zero overlap condition, right? So now zero zero means that C is equal to zero and C bar is also equal to zero. Okay. So out of all those intermediate M2, M3, M6 and M7, those transistors which are connected to C or C bar, which ones are on and which ones are off? Huh? Remember C and C bar are both 0. So M2 and M6 are on, right? The PMOS transistors are on, right? And M3 and M7 are both off at that instant, right? When C and C bar are both 0, okay? Now, from this circuit, if M2 is on and M3 is off, right, what is it that can happen to the value at x during that time? It can get pulled up. It need not, right? Under what condition will it get pulled up? If D is 0, okay? So now, if D was already 0, then we do not really have a problem. But what if D has just undergone a transition from 1 to 0 during this time? Okay, that is what we want to understand. Okay? We want to know what happens if D undergoes a transition from 1 to 0 during this interval, 0, 0 interval. Okay? So D goes from 1 to 0, X gets pulled up from 0 to 1. Okay. Right. Now, this was a zero zero condition, right? Which means that how do I get out of the zero zero condition when C bar goes to one? C remains at zero for some more time, but C bar will soon go to one, right? That's what happens after a zero zero overlap, right? So my main concern is. Whatever change I saw in D over here, which caused this transition in X, should not be allowed to go through to the output. Okay. Now, how can it go through? Essentially, the only problem that I have is if this X, which went from 0 to 1, can in turn cause Q to go from 1 to 0. Okay. And that cannot happen because M7 is off and it remains off until the next clock edge. Okay. So Q will not change. Okay. This is the only possible problem that I can have with a C equal to C bar equal to 0. Right? If the other situation happens, that is D goes from 0 to 1, then it only means that that other PMOS is also turning off and X will not change anyway. Okay. So any transition during that interval. My main concern is during these overlap intervals, if there is some transition, what will it do to the output? Okay. And in this case, what we are seeing is during the transition, uh, during that overlap interval, if there is a transition, if D goes from 0 to 1, I really do not care because it does not change the output in any way. But if it goes from 1 to 0, still it will get frozen at X and will not go through to the next stage. Okay. At most, what has happened is it has gone through the first stage, which normally it should not have. The first stage should have already become frozen, but still it managed to go through, but still it will get prevented from going through to the second stage. Okay. So, D will not go through to Q. Okay. What about the other condition? C is equal to C bar is equal to 1. Right. This is a 1 1 overlap. And when does it happen? It happens when C is actually supposed to go from 0 to 1, that is at the positive edge of the clock. 
So C has already gone from 0 to 1. C bar is still taking some time to go back to 0. Okay. So this is at the positive edge of the clock. Right? This term pos edge is something that you know when you get into very long coding or something, you'll see regularly. It's just a short form for positive edge. Okay. So what happens here? When we are having this C equal to C bar equal to 1. Now it means that both the PMOS M2 and M6 are off, M3 and M7 are on. Okay. What that in turn means is if B makes a transition now, what transition would I be concerned with? Essentially 0 to 1. Okay, so D going from 0 to 1 can cause M4 to turn on, M3 is already on, X can discharge. Okay. Right. So X discharging, what will happen over here? After this, after a small amount of time, right, C bar is going to go to 0, okay, X can go down to 0, C bar goes to 0, so M5 will turn on, whatever change I made at that gap will actually make its way through to Q, okay. Why is it that I do not want this? Because I want my transitions to be clean. I want to make sure that when one stage goes opaque, the other side becomes transparent and the other way around. Now I am sit sitting in a situation where one side has actually sort of gone into the freeze mode, but the other one is still transparent and allowing some data to get through. So this is what I don't, do not want. Okay. So the question is, as far as I am concerned, this is an undesirable transition. This B going from 0 to 1 at this clock edge, I do not want it to go, to go through to Q, okay, ideally. But having said that, in this case, all that we are saying is, if at all it does go through to Q, all that we can say is, okay, it anyway happened at the rising edge of the clock. So it is an acceptable transition. It does not sort of violate my behavior. The previous one, 0, 0 overlap would have been a big no-no because that would have caused a change which actually happens at the falling edge of the clock for a rising edge trigger flip flop that should never happen i should never see a change at the falling edge of the clock okay now what i'm saying is at the rising edge of the clock there is a possibility that the output changes i can accept it i don't have a problem with that right we'll just go ahead with what we have over there but if you want to prevent this right Just set a whole time constraint. So what do I mean by a whole time constraint? See, why is this undesirable? This is acceptable in the sense that it is at the rising edge, right? But not acceptable because it was after the clock transition. Okay. Look at what happened over here. What I am saying is C has already gone from 0 to 1. Then D has changed and that is causing the output to change. Okay. That sort of defeats the idea of a flip-flop or something which is just sampling data at a certain instant. Okay. The flip-flop ideally should just see what is the data at the instant that the clock is changing and copy that through to the output. Now what I am saying is the clock has changed the data changed a little bit time after that, still that is reflected at the output. I do not want that. How can I avoid that? I just put a whole time constraint on it and say, look, you are not allowed to change it here. Okay? It's not that it will break the behavior of the circuit, but just to sort of go back to my behavior, to my expected behavior, that the flip-flop actually samples the data exactly at the clock edge, I can just put a constraint on it and say, don't allow the data to change immediately after the clock edge. Okay. So, in other words, this structure 
acts as a edge trigger D flip flop, which is relatively insensitive to the overlap between the clocks. Okay, it does not really matter that there is an overlap between the clocks in this case. Under both conditions, 0, 0 or 1, 1 overlap, the behavior can be made to be correct. Okay. In the first case, the behavior will automatically be correct. It will take care of making sure that the problem does not come through. In the second case, it could come through, but then you can put a constraint and prevent it from happening. Okay. This kind of structure is called clocked CMOS. Okay. Otherwise called C square MOS. Okay. So why clock CMOS? Obvious reason, it is like a CMOS inverter except that you have also put a clock circuit into the internal structure to allow and to control when it behaves like an inverter and when it behaves like a latch. That is to say when it goes into the freeze mode. Okay. Now, let us just quickly look at that circuit element once again. This is just a level triggered latch, right? Whenever C is equal to 0, C bar is equal to 1, it is transparent, D will go through to Q. Whenever C becomes equal to 1 and C bar becomes equal to 0, the opposite happens, right? It just goes into the freeze mode, okay? Now, if you look at the structure carefully, right? And if I just connect up these two points. Okay. What does the resulting circuit look like? What have I done? I have essentially taken the top PMOS drain and the bottom NMOS drain and shorted them together. What happens as a result of that? It is a regular CMOS inverter at that point, right? So, effectively, it becomes something which looks like this. What are the other two transistors doing? Are they irrelevant now or are they still playing a part? Where am I taking the output from? I am not taking the output from this point, from the drain of these two. I am taking it from the output of those two, right? So, effectively it is as though those two transistors have now been connected like this. Okay. What is this structure? It is a transmission gate, not a pass transistor. This is a transmission gate, right? When you have both the PMOS and the NMOS together, it is called a transmission gate, right? It does not have the sort of weak 0 or weak 1 problem because either the PMOS or the NMOS will take care of conducting at any given time, right? So, this transmission gate is effectively controlling when the output can change, right? So, in other words, these two structures are more or less identical, right? They behave almost the same way, right? And you will find that a lot of the other dynamic latch structures that are created will use either one or the other of these two structures. Okay. So, this one on the left hand side is effectively a tri state inverter. This does not have a specific name, it is just an inverter plus a transmission kit, right. Functionally, they are almost identical. There is a slight difference because of that connection over there, but they behave very similar. Okay. All right. So now we have looked at some particular uh, large structures, right? What I'm going to do very quickly is just look at a few more slightly complex large structures, or rather, simpler large structures growing onto slightly more complex structures, right? 
all of this is sort of discussed in detail in the book by Westay and Harris. They have a sort of sequence of different latches, latch designs that exist, right? And the idea is to sort of see, okay, what's, how can you sort of grow from the simplest to the more complex designs and what are the relative benefits or disadvantages of each, okay? So this is more just for a review of how latches behave and how you can sort of have different kinds of uh, characteristics associated with them, right? So what we can say for example is, this in some sense is the simplest possible latch, right? How does it work? When C is equal to 1, it is transparent, right? Whatever is at B will go through to Q. When C is equal to 0, Q will be floating and will retain its charge for as long as it can subject to leakage and other such problems. Okay? So it behaves like a latch. Right? It has a number of problems, of course. One is the fact that you know the NMOS is not good at transferring 1. Right? So it has a weak 1 problem. So Q will not go up to VDD, it can go at most only up to VDD minus VT, that's one issue. Right? The other issue is there is a big problem associated with sort of feedback noise in the sense that if there is something which causes a disturbance at Q, right, that will just happily pass through the transistor. This transistor in other words is not directional, it does not impose which side the data is allowed to flow to. Whereas normally in logic gates we would prefer that the data goes only in one direction from input to output. Over here it does not distinguish between the input and output. So if there is something, some noise which can cause a change at Q, that will in turn reflect at D. Okay. Is that a problem? It may be, it may not be. It is not very clear. But it is definitely undesirable. It is not something we want in a regular logic gate. Okay. A slightly better version of this is this. Right? For obvious reasons, it has just fixed one problem, which is the weak one problem, okay, by putting a PMOS also in parallel. The disadvantage, of course, is now you need clock bar as well. Okay? So, routing the clock bar, generating clock bar, all of those are additional headaches as far as this is concerned. Okay? It still has the problem that anything at the output will sort of affect the input. The other thing is, if you look at the output mode, Q, right? We are relying on whatever capacitance is there at Q to store the charge, right? So preferably I would want to have a relatively high value of the capacitor of capacitance over there, right? So that it can guarantee that it will actually hold the charge for a significant amount of time and not just leak away very quickly, okay? But right now if I just take this as a gate, I don't know what it is going to be connected to. I don't know if it's going to be connected to some other NAND gate or to an inverter or to directly to an output of the circuit, right? So because of that, it is not very clear what is the output capacitance that can actually be relied on in order to hold that charge, right? So to prevent that, one thing you can do is sort of buffer the output, right? Say that, look, I don't know where you are going to connect the output. So to prevent that kind of an issue from happening, I will just sort of isolate the output from the input. Okay? Simplest way to do that is put an inverter over there. Right? Because an inverter, a static CMOS inverter will take care of sort of cleanly separating the input from the output. Okay? So by having this structure, of course now it is Q bar and not Q which is coming through, does not matter for most practical purposes, you do not really care about one inversion of that sort. Okay? Another variant of this is where you could just put the inverter at the beginning instead. Okay? Does this help in terms of the output charge storage? No, but on the other hand, it sort of separates the input and says that look, at least some noise at the input will get filtered out before it passes through the latch. Because that inverter at the input will act as a restoring logic gate which will prevent any random noise from just coming through. Ideally, I would like to have inverters at both the input and the output. 
okay that way the input is separate isolated the output is isolated and the transmission gate just takes care of the transparency aspect okay all of these are the so called dynamic latches for the simple reason that they rely on some capacitor to store the charge right we can go further and essentially say i will put a tri state inverter over here okay this is now a static latch right because in the condition where c is equal to 1 that is it is transparent this is actually behaving as a proper feedback loop okay so yeah, yeah or you know, c c is equal to 0 this is transparent and c c bar over here right this becomes a proper static latch okay now what is typically done is this is much better in terms of the charge storage it does not have the problem that the output can abruptly change or anything like or can leak away but is still affected by all of these problems with respect to the input and the output right is there any noise at the output can it feed back into the system is there any noise at the input can it affect the system right so typically what is done in that case is as we sort of go forward right then i am sort of skipping ahead a multiple uh, couple of stages the latch that is considered sort of the most robust and relatively well used as a standard cell at least will have a structure which looks something like this So what does this do? This inverter takes care of input isolation. This other inverter here takes care of output isolation. This takes care of static feedback, and this over here takes care of breaking the loop. For feeding new data. Okay. So, in some sense, this has taken all of the considerations that we had up to now and combined them into one latch. However, it is much larger than the other latches that we considered. Right. So, this is the kind of latch that we would design if, in general, you are asked to say, okay, you know, give me a latch which will work under all conditions. Okay, it's a safe latch. If you know that you do not expect much input noise or output noise, or you know, you have some other characteristic depending on the leakage. you could get away with one of the other latches that you could use in the circuit that we looked at before okay all right we'll stop here for now